forward and connects us to each other. The space has been a wonderful place for our classes, very accessible for our, for our participants outside of CSU and easily supports the collaboration across CSU and the many academic disciplines. Um, it's, it's an anchor really, if you will, the, this, this building um, on campus for a lot of different um, entities from the community and the university to, to collaborate on different projects. Connection. We as humans look for connection to other people, to other sentient beings, to the natural world, to the spiritual world. And in that connection, we learn more about ourselves. We build relationships, we problem solve together, we talk through needs and concerns, and we process shared experiences. Sometimes those relationships are defined by a common challenge. Living with Parkinson's is a challenge shared by an extraordinary group of people that I am honored to work with. Not only individuals living with Parkinson's, but their partners, their caregivers, and in addition, the CSU faculty and students from the music therapy program, the occupational therapy program, the Kendall Reagan Nutrition Center, and of course, CSU Dance. In this collaborative work, we all grow and we learn and we thrive. And ultimately, I hope we improve everyone's overall well-being. The sessions are focused on managing the symptoms of Parkinson's to move together and connect in ways that help us to feel better, both physically and emotionally. They are inspiring and healing and different for everyone involved. We feel and sense, we dance together, Live music accompanies every move that we make. We laugh, we care, we check in. It's a community that we all depend on and we care for each other. Living with Parkinson's and aging as well can be isolating. Depression is common and managing the symptoms and the medications associated is a full-time job. My hope is that the movement, the social interaction, and the exercise help people to feel better, to improve their symptoms and move forward with positivity and with hope. What has always been central to my work is the converging of movement and exercise as therapy with creative practices, finding the interaction and how the two areas complement each other. The arts can transcend and transport us, sometimes in surprising ways. And they help us to find meaning, to tell our story through music, through movement, image, poetry, writing, can help us to experience in the moment a memory, a greater awareness of our bodies, sensitivities, expression beyond words. This image is from a project that we presented earlier this year on the stage at the University Center for the Arts. The piece was called the Balancing Act. And it was based on a poem by Barbara Smith on becoming Parkinsonian. Barbara has been a participant in the program for a long time and has lived with Parkinson's for more than 20 years. This is Billy Palakowski, who's been with me since the beginning of our classes, and Sharon Wilson, a dancing colleague of mine sharing a story of the Parkinson's journey through performance. Through these experiences with the arts, I believe we can be more present in the moment to connect with our emotions and come away changed. We might stand taller, see more around us, connect with others and the outside world in renewed ways and feel more confident and step into the rest of our day as our very best selves. I truly believe this is an integral part of healthy aging. And now I'm gonna share a video that was created by CSU Media about our program.
so the focus of the classes is really about bringing movement as therapy to these people who are living with Parkinson's disease. So we're combating stiffness, lack of rhythm that they're challenged with, their gait management, and, um, and also sense of balance, coordination, agility, all those pieces. Music in this group and this, this exercise has changed my Parkinson's from being defining me to me defining it. And I love, I love this group and I love this exercise. We have a common problem. Um, you know, laughter is, a bit, is best no matter what you're doing. So, uh, and we have a group that likes to laugh. The live music has been an incredible asset to supporting the intention of the, of the motion or the movement that we're doing. The musicians are, are trained and also so willing um, and have that ability to match the movement. The most satisfying thing has been challenging myself and it's a lot of trial and error but that has been the exciting part. It's just a lot of growth and development in that way. And of course talking with the people in the class before because they're a lively bunch. I'm sorry if that sound was not strong enough for you all to hear. Parkinson's is a movement disorder that presents differently in everyone with physical, emotional, and cognitive challenges. The physical exercises and the movement are designed to increase our range of motion, increase our spatial awareness and coordination, to build strength and endurance, to improve our balance, to combat stiffness and that rigidity that comes along with, with Parkinson's, and to gain strategies and tools that we can use on a daily basis outside of class. At the same time, we know that Parkinson's also affects the brain. So much of the research says to keep moving. We can change our brains. Neuroplasticity is a real thing. We can reestablish the wiring and pathways in the brain and combining and integrating the physical, emotional, and cognitive realms. We're asking several areas in the brain to work together. We increase our blood and oxygen flow, which keeps our muscles firing and our bones strong. Parkinson's can decrease our range of movement, motion excuse me, throughout the body. So we focus on large, expansive movement, as well as fine, detail, precise movement. Bringing awareness to how our body is being affected with attention and focus, we can improve and strategize gain new tools to access later in our day or in our night. Our brains are tremendously underutilized. We all know that hydration and nutrition are key, and yes, there are many factors that can lead to not drinking enough water and getting the food we need. Add in medication management and it gets complicated and overwhelming. We need to have a team. Being mindful. Again, there's more and more research out there about the benefits of meditative practice. This can include being mindful in ways that support our healing and our aging, adding to our self-care toolbox. There are many players in the room with this program, gaining experience, lending their experience, their expertise, and developing research projects, bringing even more arts experiences to our participants. The CSU Music Therapy students, the Music Therapy Program, who you just saw in the video, guided by the Music Therapy Professor Kyle Wilhelm, they are with us every class. The live music is undeniably essential and a win-win situation for everybody involved. This is a practicum for them. I think I can speak for the students in saying how empowering it is for them to see the impact of their playing, the magic moments when it all comes together. It's really indescribable at some times. The Kendall Reagan Nutrition Program 
is housed in the center. Barbara Smith, who I mentioned earlier, is also a professor emeritus with the CSU Nutrition and Food Science Program. And in collaboration, a nutrition toolkit for people learn living with Parkinson's was created and hopefully will be distributed far and wide. OT students helped me in the classes with additional support and spotting, gaining practical experience. We developed our first video project with this program for people to access these classes from home and additional OT tips produced by these students. From the community, we work with Impact Dance Company, a professional contemporary company based in Fort Collins. They bring a high level of creative practice and performance to the group, often working with text and writings and exploring creative expression through their movement. And these are students from our CSU dance program and they have the opportunity to explore how their training can be applied in a setting like this and with this population. The moments of engagement and joy are wonderful for both groups. One of the pieces I love about working with so many students across CSU is this multi-generational piece. It's just a win-win situation for everybody. I think it needs to happen more. There aren't many practicum experiences for our dance students and in this kind of setting, so I'm grateful to be able to offer that to them. A kind of learning and experience happens that can be hugely impactful for students and the participants. I love this image because Marty is getting a range of motion and energy in his movement that is only attained really in dancing across from Mia, who is reaching those beautiful long arms to the sky. And so it's this connection that here you can clearly see how beneficial that is to work with another person, but the age is, is, a, is a beautiful piece. So back to that connecting piece, sharing stories, dancing together with live music. It's very interactive and stimulating. It's fun. And in those moments, we forget about what is challenging and we celebrate that connection, the lightness. And these experiences give, the, give everybody the opportunity to thrive. Several, several of our dance students have gone on to study dance therapy physical therapy, and to bring these experiences into their own teaching or creative practice. I need to give a shout out to the people that we work with. The Parkinson's Association of the Rockies helps to make these classes happen. They're located in Denver and help to make classes happen all across the Front Range. The local support group is the Parkinson's support group of Larimer County. Michelle Underhill, who is a speech therapist, um, heads up that group. And I've also done a couple different workshops um, and trainings with Colorado in Motion and of course, Impact Dance Company. So this is an image of Barbara Smith. She was the one I mentioned earlier. Um, she, she reminds me as well as Billy that it's fun to play. In playing, we forget about our challenges and we move and we connect, we socialize. And in that we practice gratitude throughout the whole class and hopefully that they take that with them through their day. Ultimately, well-being is about connection and community. And when we connect with someone, we do connect with ourselves and celebrate our community. So in closing, I would like to have us all move together for a moment and connect a little bit more to yourself it's hard because I can't see you all, but I'm hoping that you can see this. And I just want you to move in the chair that you're in, maybe sit a little taller, take a deep breath, listen to the music. And just watch the grass that's going back and forth. And we're just gonna take two deep breaths together. Here we go. Inhale through the nose, out through the mouth. And go. Inhale, breath in. And exhale. One more. And deep breath in. And exhale.
And hopefully in this time of disconnect, when we're having to be away from our family, away from our friends, away from our colleagues, and it's an unsettling time and a struggling time for many people, it's nice to connect with all of you. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna finish with one last slide with some recognition of the people that are involved in the program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, we can give a couple minutes if you guys have questions, put those in the chat. Um, if we don't have any questions, we can move on, but I'll, I'll give a little a minute just to see if anybody has any questions and just throw those in the chat. I don't know how that sound, if you could hear the video playing, of course, my Bluetooth speaker didn't. It, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. No. Didn't cooperate for me. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody has any questions that come up later throughout the presentation, feel free to put those into the chat and we'll uh, have at the end, we can have Lisa if those come up and we'll get those answered. Um, okay. I'll get my, well, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, thank I'll, you, Brian. Yeah. All right, and uh, to our next portion of our presentation, we're gonna have our second speaker of the night for the next two topics. Her name is Dr. Nicole Earhart, one of Colorado State's foremost experts in transitional medicine and has been named the director of Columbine Health System Center for Healthy Aging. She is the first woman at CSU to receive a university endowed chair and is a veterinarian board certified surgical oncologist and professor, professor of surgical oncology. Her presentations will include The Great Danes and Granddads, What Man's Best Friend Can Tell Us About Human Aging, and then we'll have a short Q&A after that. And then she'll also talk about uh, how they're helping out with uh, healthy aging has been on the front lines during this pandemic that we're currently in. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Nicole Earhart and welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks everyone. Um, Ryan, I think you'll have to help me share my screen or give me host or something like that. Yep. But um, thanks so much for joining us. And I feel um, I can see that there's quite a few people on, but it can't, I can't all see you. So, but you'll, I'll just share my screen here, um, hopefully. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll move right on so we can talk, talk about this great things and granddads thing. Get that queued up. Um, so anyway, I, it's an odd title, I realize, and um, part of that's because I think this is a really fascinating topic that few people have thought about, including those in the scientific community, like myself, until pretty recently. Um, but, but we know in terms of the aging world that people from, really from recorded history, have been absolutely obsessed with finding some kind of panacea uh, to aging. So we've been obsessed about recapturing our youth. And you can see evidence of this in recorded history way, way back. So this is one example of that. This is a, um, a painting that depicts the fountain of youth. It was done in the year 1500 in Germany. And you can kind of see that the artist sort of shows this, these older people that are entering the fountain on the left-hand side. And as they swim across the fountain and progress from left to right, they begin to be restored into a youthful appearance. And then when they exit the fountain, they are invited to participate in this great feast and are dressed in finery. So this concept that we somehow can either recapture our youth or change how we age is fascinating, fascinated all of humankind for many, many years. But of course, as we've progressed in our understanding of biology and modern medicine, what we've learned is that we can observe aging in every living thing. So it's universal. We know that all things age. And it seems that, at least until recently, it is a fairly inevitable sort of unmodifiable decline um, down into our old age and eventual death. Now we can observe this, right? We observe it in every living creature. We can look at someone's face, for example, and see if they are old or young just by what we see in our visual features. 
But even if we go below the skin on every level of our, you know, kind of biology, we see aging as well. So this is a brain that from a young person on the left here versus a brain from an older person. So you can see a difference here. You can see that there's um, a difference between the muscle tissue um, of, a left, uh, of a young person on the left versus an older person, the cells of a young person versus an older person, and even down to the molecular biology, the molecular details within our cells, we can actually see and observe aging. So scientists can actually take a single strand of DNA and look at that and decide and determine whether the person is old or young just by looking at the different markers on that. Um, on that molecule. So that's a really fascinating thing. And of course, if you're a scientist, your very first question from like the time you're born <laughs> is to ask the question, why? Why do we age? How do we age? How does this actually happen? And so we've been asking that question for many years. And so if you are an aging research, of course, researcher, it's really important that you actually define aging. Because if you think about it, it's kind of hard to define aging. In fact, if you were to walk into a room and ask 10 different people how they're defining aging or what their definition would be, it's different. It's different for everybody. But if you're a scientist and you want to study the biology of aging, what you define aging is the following. So aging is the process that happens when we accumulate damage to ourselves, particularly within our cells, our cells, C-E-L-L, -L, um, as a result of the normal function of our everyday living. So it's just that we accumulate damage over time. And it's not anything that's really big, it's the stuff that goes unnoticed. We call it micro damaging, but it's everything from the wear and tear on your joints to the sunburn you get to you know, just even the number of times your heart beats over, over your lifespan. And while we're young, we do a pretty de decent job of, of repairing damage, but this micro damage, the stuff that's not even detectable to us or we don't really notice, but just accumulates over time. And that's what basically causes our wrinkles and our aches and pains as we get older. So that's how we define aging. Now, it'd be wonderful if we were like this beautiful classic car. And I'm not a car enthusiast, so forgive me if I don't have the year right, but this car is probably 60 years, 70 years old, I don't know, old, and yet it's running in perfect condition. Well, how is it that this 60, 70 year old car can be running in perfect condition decades after its kind of expected lifespan, when all of the other cars that were produced at the same time that it was are now in the junkyard or rusted or recycled or whatever. And of course, we all know that the reason this is happening is because somebody's restored the car. Somebody took all the parts out and lovingly and with great detail refurbished the worn out parts, replaced parts that were broken, even polished up the paint and got all the chips out. And now we have a car that while it has maybe on the outside, a look that's mildly dated, it is running beautifully decades after you would expect it to be. Well, is, can we do this? Is, that's the big question. Is this something that we could do in a living thing, not just a machine, but in a living creature? And more and more, we're beginning to understand that the answer to that is, yes, we can. And I know that sounds kind of crazy and science fiction-y, but bear with me here. So we've been asking the question, can we turn back the clock? Or can we change our trajectory of aging so that we're starting to slow down this, what we used to think was an inevitable decline into something that maybe we can modify and change? And there've been some clues to this along the way. Like we know that for example, a, a lifestyle that has a lot of exercise in it is good for you, right? And you live longer. And we also know things like good sleep and even caloric restriction are actually things that improve our longevity or our lifespan. So there's the clues that we've learned over the years that yeah, maybe aging is modifiable, but how is it modifiable? So let's just take these two people, and these are two really good examples, maybe extreme examples, but both of these people are in their 80s, both of them are 82. In fact, they share the same birthday, they're not twins or brothers, they, they just happen to look a little bit alike, but clearly the person on the left is very different than the person on the right in terms of his, long, like his vitality and fitness, versus the person on the right. So what's different about these two people? Um, you know, person on the left is clearly 82, been on the planet the same number of years as this person on the right. And yet somehow that person on the right has gone down a less successful aging trajectory. Person on the right is maybe more typical of what we might expect in people's eighth decade, ninth, ninth decade of life, where they're needing some assistance to walk, they may have some you know, medication needs, maybe there's some dementia, et cetera. 
So there's something very different about these two people. And what's really fascinating is if you start to look at populations of people in their 80s and 90s, you find that they really fall into two very divergent groups of people with not a lot of people in between. You know, they're either the people that are out there on the golf course, you know, five days a week, still driving, probably on very few medications. And then there's people that are more like the guy on the right who need a lot more help and need a lot more medical care just to even kind of function on a daily basis. So it's been fascinating to think about like what is really different about these two people and how and when do they begin to diverge down their different aging pathways. So scientists have been studying this for a long time. And it turns out that the answer to that question about why they are different has to do with their cells. So down to the level of our cells, we can actually figure out what drives aging on a cellular basis. And this is a culmination of like 20 years of research. So this is, I'm simplifying it into these nine different things that are depicted on the wheel on the left. And they are, they're called by scientists, the nine hallmarks of aging. They're the nine things that happen in cells that drive aging. And these nine hallmarks are drivers of aging. They tend to accumulate in us as we age. So if you look at this gentleman again, and we were to look down at his cells, what we would find is that there, he has far more of those drivers of aging within his cells than the man that's very fit. Okay. And so that's a really important finding. So from the chronological perspective, they've been on the planet the same amount of time. They're exactly the same age, but from a cellular perspective, the man that's really fit is younger than the man that is less healthy. So this starts to th make us think, okay, well, if you can change it by lifestyle changes, and if we can see it on a cellular level, then there must be some way to modify how we age, must be some way to turn the knobs, if you will, on aging to maybe adjust or refurbish or reverse some of those cellular changes that we see. And that's what we've been really interested in for years. Now, if you're an aging researcher, these are the tools of your trade, okay? They look kind of silly because they're in a cartoon form, but what aging researchers love to work on are things like um, yeast, which is this guy here, kind of looks like an astronaut, worms, fruit flies, and zebrafish. And so the reason why scientists get all geeked out over these four creatures is because they have a very short lifespan. So they're really easy to study lifespan studies. So you can study, for example, a, a lifespan experiment in a yeast organism in a matter of hours. And if you get all the way to zebrafish, it's a matter of weeks. But it allows you to do lots and lots of experiments with lots of different conditions to figure out what it is that's changing what's happening on the whole organism. And the other thing is, is they have very simple genomes they, and very well-described genomes. So we know a lot about if we tweak this, what happens downstream. Now, if we can adjust aging in these creatures, then the next step, if we're really successful here, is to move a big leap into a warm-blooded mammal. Now, a mouse, which is the typical first mammal type of uh, model that we use in aging, is on very many magnitudes higher complexity than, for example, a yeast organism, right? And so then if we're successful in the four basic organisms and we can actually do this in a mouse, then we've got something. Then all of a sudden it becomes possible for us to maybe think about, can we make that leap? Can we get the aging, reversing aging techniques that we're using in mice and get them to work in people? And in fact, this has happened. So this is an experiment that was done um, some years ago, this is taking an old mouse, giving it a pill that, or a treatment that blocks some of these drivers of aging, and we can change the trajectory of the aging mouse. Okay, so these two mice, this is the, that experiment. So this is the results. These two mice are the same age. These are both very old mice. In the mouse on the left, you can see the characteristics of aging that you might expect in mice, the, the arched back or hunched back, loss of hair, loss of muscle mass. You can see the sunken eyes. This mouse on the right is the same age. It should look like that mouse, but it's been given one of these blockers of aging and it's changed, right? So a lot like that older gentleman that was really fit versus the gentleman that was not fit. And all of a sudden this opened up a huge world of possibility for us to maybe begin to think about how we can influence aging trajectories in people. So when this discovery was made, this was huge. The aging research community was like high-fiving in the lab. There were um, news articles coming out. There were talk shows about, you know, scientists that reverse aging, et cetera. And so we, we were very excited. And then nothing. We heard nothing. So 
the people that did that research kind of went off the radar. We were all waiting for the next big leap and nothing happened. And so you might be asking yourself, man, I must have missed this. Like, when did this happen? Well, if you're asking yourself that question, you're not alone, right? And why are we not hearing more about this even today? Well, here's what happened. And this is a story that's been told, I think, countless times in translational medicine, where we, we figure out this really promising thing that works beautifully in mice, and yet we fail to get it to people. And people refer to that process as called the translational gap. So we can't get across this chasm of difficulty between going from a mouse to a man. And over and over again, in fact, about 90% of the time, when we try to go directly with the discovery from mouse to man, we fail. Well, you might ask the question, well, why is that? Why do we fail? I mean, mice are certainly more complex and more like people than yeast. But intuitively, I think you all would agree that mice are nothing really like people. I mean, yes, again, they're a lot more like people than a yeast cell. Okay, but there's a big difference between going from a mouse to a person. Laboratory mice are essentially identical genetic twins to one another, and you know people are very diverse. We have all kinds of different genetic and epigenetic variation in our human population, um, whereas people can make lots of lifestyle choices that influence how they age, if they're exercisers or not, if they're smokers or not. Laboratory mice have a very controlled environment. They get the same light-dark cycle, they get the same food every day, and they essentially have the same amount of exercise every day. So all of these other things besides the genetics of something can really influence how we age. And because humans are so much more complex than mice, it really is not the best model to try to figure out whether something that works in a mouse will work in a people. We need some other model. We need something that mimics human aging much more closely. And of course, this is now becoming something that people are talking about more and more, not just in aging research, but in all kinds of research. And so people are saying, you know, these are just um, headlines from different websites that I copy and paste, copied and pasted here. Mice are losing their allure as experimental subjects to study human disease. Mice are great for basic research, but once you come up, once you try to mimic human disease, you run up against major differences. I love the one with how laboratory mice don't eat McDonald's. Obviously, they don't have choices that may or may not be healthy for them. And my favorite is the one that was done, that was uh, recently um, quoted by Judah Folkman, who's a famous cancer researcher. And he said, you know, if you have cancer in your mouse, no problem, we can take great care of you. Um, you know, the problem isn't curing cancer in mice, the problem is curing my, um, cancer in people. And for whatever reason, just because we're successful in the mouse, we really can't carry that into people. So we need a bridge. We need some way to get across this chasm. And the, all this discovery that I talked about earlier where we're able to reverse aging in mice has so much potential, but we haven't yet been able to get it over the bridge. So how are we gonna do that? And that's really what we're focused on at the center. How do we translate what we know works in the laboratory to get it to people in the field? So let's go back to our two gentlemen that we uh, used as examples before. So now we know three things about these people, okay? We know that the guy on the left the healthy guy, he has fewer, he, his cells look younger under the microscope than the guy on the right. The guy on the right, the cells in his body have a many more accumulated drivers of aging than this guy. And finally, we know one other thing. We know that if we can reverse aging in mice, and if the drivers of aging are the same in mice as they are in people, and they are, they are the same exactly, then somehow we should be able to manipulate these to change this person's trajectory to be a lot more like this person on the left. We are missing one very crucial piece of information though. And this is the jigsaw piece that's been missing for decades. Um, and that is when do these two people begin to diverge, okay? In their aging trajectories. We know that sometime between birth and the age of 82, something began to change. And those two people, instead of going parallel down a path, began to diverge, one going in a healthy aging pathway, the other going in a less successful aging pathway. When did that happen? The answer is we have no earthly idea. We don't know if that happened at birth. We don't know if it happened at age 20. We don't know if it happens at age 50, et cetera. What we do know is that we're a lot more likely to be successful at reversing those changes or preventing those changes if we start closer to when they began to diverge than if we try to start treating this guy with one of these blockers. It's a lot harder to reverse those changes. It'd be much better to do that earlier along in this alternative aging pathway so that we can have a bigger influence and prevent that micro damage and do more refurbishing um, so along the way. 
So now we have two additional pictures. And, um, and so what we see here are two dogs, obviously. And on the left-hand side is a Jack Russell Terrier and the right-hand side is a Great Dane. Now, both of these dogs are exactly the same age, but the dog on the left, this Jack Russell Terrier is an athlete. This dog at nine years old was the national fly ball champion in 2012. Older dog, extremely fit dog. And on the right-hand side is a nine-year-old Great Dane. Now, those of you who know anything about dogs will know that a nine-year-old Great Dane is an old Great Dane. And in fact, we can see this if we look closely, that she has that hunched back, very similar to the mouse that you saw. She's got muscle wasting. And I happen to know that this particular dog has cancer and heart disease. So this dog on the right, while they are the same exact chronological age, has many more accumulated burden of age-related disease than this dog on the left. So that's really interesting, right? Now, people understand kind of intuitively that Great Danes have a shorter lifespan. But the answer is why? Why do they have a shorter lifespan? It turns out that across all giant breeds, and that includes like Mastiffs and Irish Wolfhounds and others, they have about a half to a third as long a life as toy breed dogs. Well, scientists ask the question, why is this? And it turns out that this, if you were to look at the cells of this Great Dane under the microscope, you would find all those accumulated drivers of aging so they age more quickly than the dog that is fit, who does not have as many drivers of aging. So this Jack Russell Terrier is much more like this man on a cellular level, and this Great Dane is much more like this man on a cellular level. So that's pretty interesting, right? But here's the big aha moment for everyone, was that while we don't know when these two people begin to diverge in their aging pathway, and remember we said that was the big missing puzzle piece, we actually know when this happens in the dog. And that presents a very powerful research opportunity. And here's the deal. So when this dog becomes an adult, all of a sudden she begins to age in rapid motion relative to the Jack Russell Terrier. And this is predictable and repeatable and it's observable based on body size. So I can't look at two baby boys and, and tell you which baby boy is gonna go down a healthy trajectory of aging versus not but I can look at two puppies and I can know by their body size and their breed, which one's gonna go down a healthy aging trajectory and which one's not. Because a Great Dane puppy, I can guarantee you, is going to age in a less healthy trajectory than a Jack Russell. So now all of a sudden we have this platform that we can begin to think about these interventions that we've just talked about, these blockers of aging, and begin to use them at different times along the lifespan of these different dogs. These are pet dogs. These are our dogs that we want to live forever, right? If you're a dog lover, you know what I'm talking about. So who wouldn't want to do this kind of work that we can benefit dogs, but then also learn so much more about people? And so it turns out that not only is this body size thing a big deal, but also they age naturally alongside of us. So, you know, when we're studying age-related diseases in mice, like arthritis or cancer, we have to give them the arthritis or we have to give them the cancer. They don't naturally develop that in their lifespan, um, but dogs do. They develop it normally during their lifespan and it's sad and we treat that. And so they get good health care into old age. And what would take decades and decades and decades to study in people in terms of aging interventions, we can find out those results in only a matter of five to seven years and benefit the dogs so that they live a longer, healthier life along the way. So that is super exciting. And not only do they age naturally, but they also share our environment. So not like laboratory mice that live in a lab. These dogs are um, basically subject to our lifestyle choices. So sedentary lifestyle versus active, secondhand smoke, pollution. They share on many of our food sources. They definitely share our water sources. And like people, um, and unlike mice who are genetic twins of one another, they have genetic variability that's very similar to people. So they have genetic and epigenetic variability. So because of all those things, all of a sudden we have this beautiful new platform that actually has been with us all this time. It's not new. It's just that we never recognized that this was the missing piece. This was the missing link in the challenge of aging research. They've been growing old right beside us, and yet it can benefit both species. So that's been the big, like kind of, light bulb that's gone on is, wow, we have this beautiful model. And if you're a dog lo lover like I am, um, you, you, you know, who wouldn't want their dogs to live a longer, healthier, happy life? I mean, if we could get a Great Dane to live to 16 when, as a healthy Great Dane, that would be wonderful. If we can all live to 100 as healthy 100-year-olds, that would be wonderful. And that's the goal. So now we know we can take this old mouse and give them a blocker of this aging and make them kind of young again or renewed again. 
And we believe that we can do this in dogs. And there, are work, there is work already starting in this, that we can take these old dogs and provide these blockers of aging and make them healthy and vital again. And by using that as the platform to move into people, now we're mimicking human aging much more precisely than we would with a mouse. And so all of a sudden we have a beautiful bridge across that translational gap. So um, I'll just end this, um, this short talk with a personal story of mine um, that just kind of brings home maybe the importance of this. So um, Ryan at the beginning shared that I'm a veterinarian, I'm a surgeon, and the gentleman on the right here is uh, one of my mentors, and his name is Don Piermati. Maybe some of you on the call have known him. He was a, a giant in um, veterinary orthopedics. Many people considered him a father figure in orthopedics. Um, and he was the guy that really was the first person that taught me how to look across barriers and look across disciplines to see outside the box and to not contain my own thinking to either veterinary or human medicine, because I've worked in both fields my entire career. And he was really kind of the, the person who helped me understand that in a way that nobody else had until he came along. And um, he, was, he retired during my residency. I had the great pleasure and honor, honestly, to work with him throughout my residency. But he retired at the end of my residency. And this picture that you see on the right was taken about 15 years ago. He was receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American College of Veterinary Medicine, which was a big, uh, a big award for him. Um, so that picture was taken about 15 years ago. And then this picture was taken about three years ago. And unfortunately, Don developed um, terminal liver cancer. And he was on hospice at home during when this picture was taken. And I came to visit that day because I knew that his time uh, was rather short. And my purpose in visiting was really to share with him how grateful I was for the, the vision that he instilled in me and how um, I thought that his impact was so huge in so many lives. And anyway, we just had this really wonderful afternoon where we reminisced and shared and laughed and all this. And at one point during the afternoon, he kind of got pretty quiet and I asked if he was tired and he wanted me to leave. And he said, no, I don't want you to leave. I just, I was just thinking, you know, it just seems too soon to be done. And, um, and I was quiet and I thought about that for a long time. And I, I wish I could have shared with him what I just shared with you, this exciting, you know, kind of advancement, this leap that we've just made. We didn't even know that then, right? This was three years ago. So I wasn't able to share some of that promising work. I, I was able to at least say this, that what you leave behind is not what, you know, is, is sort of left of you in terms of your works or what's in a stone monument or your written word. It's really the legacy that you leave to others and that he left to me and, and all the people that he trained. And I really believe as I, as I think back on that conversation that the ending can be different. And that conversation really stuck with me because unbeknownst to me on the day that I visited, he passed away only 48 hours later. And so as I think back, even what we know today, only three short years later, I would have been able to say something different. I would have been able to share with him that, yeah, the, you know, it, it is too short and we're gonna work on that and we're gonna change that because who wouldn't want the great minds to be around if we could be healthy? Who wouldn't want our loved ones and our beloved canine companions to be around healthy and vital longer into their older ages? Who wouldn't want that? And if we have the power to do that, I think that's one of the greatest contributions we can make to society. So I know that for me, I mean, you know, I, I can't help but think that the creatures that we share this world with, especially those that share our homes with us, have this potential to be such a key player in what we do moving forward in medicine, particularly in aging work. And um, that's what we do at the center. So I wanted to share that with you. And I think we'll pause here um, between the presentations and see if there are any other questions before we move on. Uh, let's see. Um, one is, how can I get the research papers that your slide deck was based on? I can share those, um, probably share those with Ryan, and I'm, I'm guessing he can get that out to you. Does that sound okay, Ryan? Yeah, yeah there's some really great stuff out there. It's really exciting. I had a question about, um, it's kind of going to deal with your next topic, but since you, you're a vet, like you're very skilled with animals, I know I've heard that animals can't carry COVID, but what if it mutates? Is there any worry about that? If you're oh, coming in contact? Yeah, we can, we can talk about that um, also a little bit more after the next talk, but the short answer is in terms of, we, we have not made any, there has been no, um, no evidence that 
COVID can be transmitted from domestic animals to people. We believe that the original mutation that occurred from uh, bats to people was obviously animal to human transmission and that is not terribly uncommon with viruses, especially bats for whatever reason and there's some other species that seem to be little petri dishes for human viruses. But right now, no evidence that there can be, um, there can be transmission between domestic animals, pets or food animals and people. And then in this study, did it have a focus on like their specific diets on like, as you mentioned in one of your slides, it said McDonald's, you know, it's not fed to them. Like, yeah, um, there are a lot of, there is a lot of research out there um, talking about caloric restriction and intermittent fasting as a longevity strategy and pretty much across all species. That's the case. If you, if you feed animals like half of their, what they would normally eat on their own. So they call that ad lib eating, right? Like ad liberum. So that if they were eating on their own um, and you restrict them to half of that in the animal kingdom, you can get them to live significantly longer. And we also know that periods of intermittent fasting, and you know, there's probably, uh, you've probably heard of that kind of craze in terms of, you know, eating patterns, um, fasting and eating. Um, there is some evidence that that is actually very healthy for you too. The question is, always, you know, the next question is, what's the perfect recipe? Like, is it eight hours of fasting? Is it, you know, 12 hours? And that is not known. And it may also be, um, you know, just the total number of calories. So there's a lot more work, but at least that's one of the knobs that can be turned to change. But it does require kind of a lifelong habit of that. Um, those, those kind of lifelong habit things are always harder to get people to change to versus something that could be something we could, like a, a pill or a a therapeutic that we could actually take that would help rejuvenate, repair, that type of thing. And this sounds very, you know, I don't know, science fiction-y, but it, it really is not. I mean, it's very fact-based. So there's a lot we have to do, and there's a lot of opportunity. Does anyone else have any questions they would like to answer about this topic? Okay, should I move on to yep, the next sounds, one? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, let's see. Um, one moment, I've got to find it. I thought it was up. Oh, I know what happened here. I clicked it back. Um, I am having trouble getting it to share. Let's see. Is this, can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. That's good. Uh, okay. So this next topic is going to be completely a different style of talk. <laughs> a lot more like sciencey and um, hopefully um, just completely different topics. So, um, Ryan had asked me to share a little bit of updates about what we're doing um, related to the COVID out, uh, crisis. And um, I just wanted to share with you a picture. If you haven't seen the Center for Healthy Aging, it's located in this new um, health and medical center on Prospect and, um, and College. Um, so we're on the first floor here. Um, so that, uh, that area has you know, was designed just for the Center for Healthy Aging. So this is a really wonderful opportunity for uh, different human clinical trials to be taking place there. Uh, obviously, Lisa's moving through Parkinson's program is based there. There's a ton of different things that are happening. So it's just a very well positioned, and I'm very, very grateful to have that beautiful new space to work in. So you might ask yourself, oh, well, why would we even, why would CSU dedicate a research center, an entire research center to study aging? And I don't know how familiar you are with some of the statistics that are coming out, but we do know that for the first time in 2019, it was the first time that we saw the number of births decline below the number of people over the age of 65. And so what is uh, expected to happen is that number of people over the age of 65 is gonna continue to increase, whereas the number of new births is gonna decrease, which means that proportionally, the number of people that are in their 60s and older that 
exist on the globe is going to be very, very large. And that's the first time in human history that that's ever happened. Um, the problem, of course, is that while we're living longer, we're not really living healthier. And so probably you've, you know, you know that as we age, um, these accumulations of diseases occur over time. And the biggies being like heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and Alzheimer's, those are things that, that will happen to us at a greater proportion as we get older. So we might be living longer, but we're not living healthier. And certainly it's costing a lot. And so there's a lot of people that are concerned about what's gonna to happen to world economies with this aging population and the burden of disease. And so the idea here is not necessarily to live longer in the state that we are now, but to live healthier. And so if we could even delay aging, and we talked about how that might be possible in the last talk, by even just 20%, if we could do, slow the onset of age-related disease by 20%, it would save the U.S. alone 13 trillion in healthcare expenses over the next 20 years. And just by slowing aging, we would impact all of the diseases of aging individually on such a great scale that we would actually be living healthy into our old age rather than being a healthcare burden on the globe. And so that's really the idea. The idea, of course, is to, is to die young as late as possible. So we wanna be healthy into our old age. So people talk about lifespan versus health span. And what our goal here is not so much to increase lifespan, but to increase health span. So sort of the average person has this uh, relatively good degree of health, which begins to slowly decline over time, which leads, leads to more of an exponential decline later in life. And this, this graph is just something I drew. It's not perfectly accurate. But the idea is to push that out to the right. So instead of having this long decline, we stay really pretty healthy well into our old, old age, and then eventually, you know, that the end comes, but the end comes and uh, at a time where the time where we spend in the burden of disease is very, very small. And that's really what we're after in all of this research that we're talking about. So we talk about age-related disease, but in a sense, it's really disease related to age. So what if we began to think of aging itself as the disease? And if we could impact aging instead of sort of playing this whack-a-mole kind of medicine by trying to impact all these diseases, we would impact all of these all at once. So that, that's the kind of the holy grail that everyone's been talking about. Um, but as we think about aging in 2020, we've started to see some cracks in our system that really were things that we weren't focused on as aging researchers before. And of course, infectious disease being one. So COVID-19 has really created, um, a, a put a magnifying lens on things that are, are kind of wrong with, with how we are aging in society. Um, number one, we're all more vulnerable, right? Our immune systems aren't as good as we age. So we have physical vulnerabilities and we have like immune system vulnerabilities. And that's one reason why um, older Americans are affected much more than um, younger people. But the other things that have come up out of this are social vulnerabilities. So as a result of the pandemic, of course, we've had this social isolation and this has been extraordinarily devastating to older people. There's already an isolation that occurs as a result of advanced age in some folks. And certainly that has not been at all helped by this. There's been food insecurity. I mean, cognitive and mental health vulnerability. So all of these things have really, they, they existed before. It's just that there is such a magnitude of difference now than there was prior to the pandemic. And it really gives us an opportunity to reflect on how are we going to respond. So as the director for the Center for Healthy Aging, it was really important for me to really sit back and go, you know, I, I really haven't been thinking about infectious disease as being something that we can do, but yet here at CSU, and you all as alumni know this, that CSU is a, a tower of amazing talent in infectious disease. And we have this beautiful BSL lab that's the only one in the state that's got that big of a footprint. So we have the capacity to be a responder to this. And particularly as the director, I was very interested in responding to this older population, these vulnerabilities in a way that really couldn't be done anywhere else in the state. And so we were able to pivot very quickly from what we were doing to actually deploy a response to COVID-19. So I'm gonna share with you two different things that we've been doing and there's way more than this, but this, these are two that I have time to share tonight. So the first thing was we recognized at the beginning of the pandemic that there was a very urgent threat. And that is borne out by the statistics and you've all seen the publications and media reports that well over 56% of COVID related deaths in our state are in skilled nursing facilities. Um, even at the beginning of the pandemic, 
we, we didn't know that statistic, but we were very concerned because at the time the pandemic was starting to unfold and they were starting to lock down, what they were doing is creating these practices to involve screening workers that come into these facilities to care for these residents in older nursing homes um, for symptoms. So they would take their temp, which is good, and they would ask them if they had a cough or exposure or recent travel. And as long as they didn't, they could come to work. But we were suspicious, and this was um, work that uh, a conversation that I had with Dr. Greg Ebel, who's the director of the Arthropod Born Vector Laboratory at CSU. He and I had a conversation that, you know, what was not making sense to us is that I th we thought that the people that were positive for COVID, for SARS CoV 2, probably were positive for a lot longer than when they started showing symptoms. And we were pretty suspicious based on knowing what other coronaviruses do that they could potentially be a large number of people that were asymptomatic out there. Now this was in the beginning of March and nobody was talking about asymptomatic spread. People were really focused on diagnosing and testing. And remember, this was a time when there was very little testing that was available. So what was used was um, used only for sick people. And um, so we started, um, because we were this concerned and we knew that if these Trojan horses, these people that were coming in to do all the good work that they wanted to do to care for the people that in these um, residential living facilities, if they were positive, it was like a spark in a powder keg that we were gonna see some very, very bad outbreaks. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So as a result of that, we started, and this was just through my own startup money and Greg Ebel's startup money, um, a longitudinal surveillance project of asymptomatic workers in six different nursing, facility, nursing home facilities. And so this was our pilot work to try to see what was going on in this asymptomatic spread situation and see if we could influence how spread would occur in these and maybe mitigate spread to save the lives of these people in these homes. And so how we did this is we consented 600 people, and this was across six different facilities, um, to let us do nasal pharyngeal swabs, which is not a very comfortable procedure. Those of you who have had it know. Uh, weekly for eight weeks because we didn't want to just do a snapshot of one point in time. We wanted to see how things were changing over time. And the entry criteria, you had to be a worker in a nursing home. You had, no, you had to have no reported COVID-19 symptoms, no known exposure, and you had to consent to letting us swab you eight weeks in a row, which that was very kind of them to let us do. And if we found out that you were positive for the test and we did RT-PCR, so that's exactly the same test the CDC and all the diagnostics labs were doing, we're doing exactly the same test. What we asked workers to do is agree to self-isolate, but continue to be tested weekly by nasal pharyngeal swab. So we would go to their car and test them rather than have them come to work. And if we found a positive, then we confirmed it by two independent labs and reported that to public health officials, which we were mandated to do by law. And so that, this way we just made sure we weren't getting any false negatives or false positives. Well, we found something pretty alarming and that was that 15% across the board of these 600 people, 15% of them were positive. They had no idea they were positive, they felt fine, they had no known exposure. And if we looked across again, six different nursing homes, it wasn't like they were 15% in every nursing home, it was ranging from 1% in some, to up to 23 and 26% in the others. And so that was really interesting. And we also found that depending on the worker type, sometimes we see higher prevalence of infected, asymptomatic infected people in certain worker types. And this was a really curious finding to us because you would think that you know people that had direct patient contact would be the most likely to be positive because if someone was COVID positive, they were caring for. And truly, I mean, the nursing, um, so down here is the chart, and this is kind of their job code nursing. Yeah, 24% of the nursing um, staff that we were testing were positive. But look at this, 50% of the maintenance people were positive. That's amazing to me. And so what it suggests is that there might be ways in which we could, um, you know, train people for practicing, you know, good hand washing or wearing of masks appropriately or having the right PPE in different job codes differently than what was happening in the field at the time. Also, interestingly, is that while we thought a lot of these people might be pre-symptomatic, 80% of them remained asymptomatic through the entire eight-week period. They never got sick. In fact, they didn't believe that they were positive. They thought our test was wrong they, because we were asking them to stay home. They were ir irritated with that um, because they felt fine. And yet we were able to confirm that they were positive in two different labs in, in addition to ours. And that the mean number of weeks that they were positive was two, but we did have people that were positive for more than six weeks which was an issue. 
But what was, what was happening over time, and this was what was really remarkable, is that as we asked those people and we, we detected them early before they got symptomatic and before they were in their workplace for a long time and asked them to go home, we could see that the incidence of outbreaks in those facilities was diminishing over time. And the number of resident deaths was diminishing over time, which was ultimately the goal. So that was hugely powerful. And we were really excited about that. So um, not only did we do that, but we kind of dove in pretty deep on this study because one of the things that was being argued in the scientific community and medical community at the time was, oh, well, you know, if you're asymptomatic, it's really unlikely that you can spread the virus. And actually our work showed absolutely that's incorrect. And this is called a plaque assay. And basically what it is is if you take live virus from a sample that you get in the nasopharyngeal region, and then you swab it on live cells and it kills the cells, then we know that we have infectious virus there and that's called a plaque assay. So the, the killed cells are those white spots there. And sure enough, it confirmed that infectious um, virus was in the majority of samples and that this was a linear relationship between the number of plaque forming units or the number of infectious particles we had versus the RT-PCR, the number of copies of RNA that we had in there. And then finally, our deeper dive was to look at the genomics, um, the genetics of the virus. And so we did deep sequencing on the virus strains that we picked up in these um, facilities. And sure enough, so the, the, what we were asking was, is this infection coming from workers into facilities from the community? Are they picking it up at Home Depot or at the grocery store and then coming to work? And all these people are just picking it up in the community and coming to work? Or are they spreading it from person to person within the facility? And the phylogenetics that we, we were able to show actually clearly, very clearly suggested that it was happening within the facility. So they were spreading it from worker to worker. That's good news and bad news because the good news is, is that if you know it's being spread within the facility and you can get those people out early, then you know you decrease the number of new infections. That's exactly what we saw. It was coming from the community, then it was kind of a random chance that you'd have this import event or you know, you'd have an infection come into the facility and that is a little bit harder to control, right? So we did actually show that finding these people early was really important strategy in mitigating new, um, new outbreaks. So the conclusions from this were that screening for COVID-19 symptoms not only was, was not su sufficient to identify positive workers, there was a large number of people that we were missing that were kind of the Trojan horses or the vectors bringing this in to this very vulnerable population, which was terrifying. Um, and then asymptomatic positives do actually have high virus loads and they are infectious to other people that if you isolate those people or ask them to stay home from work, it decreases the new infections over time in the facility. And most importantly, that serial testing could serve as an early warning system, kind of the tripwire. Um, so if you're doing it over time, you know, weekly, um, you're actually creating kind of this perimeter, safety perimeter that you'll detect it before it gets too far and then taking those people out of circulation, if you will. So that's a mitigation strategy that we think is really important to uh, combat future outbreaks in nursing home facilities. And certainly the one-time testing is not going to be sufficient because there's always the chance that you're going to have an importation event and then it's going to spread in the facility itself. So all of that was pretty much self-funded out of our kind of startup money. And then we went to Governor Paulus with it and said, look, this is a really big deal. We need to change how we're doing um, testing in these residential care facilities. And sure enough, um, as a result of that, it resulted in a statewide um, effort now. So all residential care settings are being tested over this eight week program that we developed that it's more than 100, greater than 1,000, I mean, um, care facilities in the state. Um, we were uh, very fortunate to um, have received a $4.3 million grant to expand our cohort now to over 45,000 tests. Um, so we're in the process of doing that now. So that'll give us even a bigger sample size and also will help us understand what's happening now in as society has loosened up on their social distancing restrictions versus when we did the pilot, which was during the biggest part of lockdown. And also um, the results have been noticed by, uh, noted by the CDC who has contacted us um, and asked us to share our, our samples with them so that they can maybe apply this, um, this kind of philosophy to a greater number of states and, and present this in Washington. So that's what's happening. We did uh, publish a preprint on MedArchive, which we can make available to those on the call if you're interested. And then we still have um, media and TV radio interviews that are ongoing right now. And we're gonna uh, share a link to our website and so you can see a lot of the media coverage that's happened 
um, over this particular project. So it's been one of those things that you never expected, um, a, a door that opened that we were able to respond. And really it's, it's to credit CSU, number one, for even having the foresight to have an aging center, number two, to having this infectious disease expertise, and then just the fact that people got behind this and were able to do this and including the governor and now, you know, this is a statewide effort. So I really think that CSU is, is really the, you know, blue ribbon winner here in terms of being the only uniquely um, positioned place to be able to respond in this way. Um, I, I won't spend much time on the other things because there's a lot of other things and, and they're just as important. So one of the things we've been doing is this expert Q&A COVID uh, webinar series, um, which we can share the link to our next one that's coming up. Um, but this is where we solicit community questions from nonprofit and service organizations that are involved in helping older adults in the community. Um, things like United Way and Meals on Wheels and people that really don't know how to best protect themselves and protect the people they serve. Um, and they don't know how to apply, you know, what's uh, information coming from the CDC or even local public health to what they do. So we've gathered CSU experts in mental health, in exercise science, in food safety, infectious disease and biosafety. And we ask, we answer their questions. We just have this live Q&A. We, we ask them to pre-submit questions and then we also have live questions. And then we're also publishing a monthly newsletter that will, that provides a lot of information about resources for older adults in Colorado and particularly in Larimer County and other surrounding communities. So, you know, these are just some examples of how the center has been able to respond in, in this time of COVID. Um, and so I'll share with you some contact info. There's our, our Healthy Aging website on the right. Um, if you're interested, we desperately still need funding to advance some of these things that the um, state funded program is actually just enough to get those tests done. It doesn't really help us with the research. So that's the research part, like where we're doing the genetics and other things. So we would always welcome um, donations. Um, and then we do have upcoming events, which um, Ryan has graciously agreed to share with you all in, in his newsletter. Um, and uh, we would more than welcome you at any of those events. We, we definitely want to be out in the community and, and meet you and hope either virtually or hopefully someday in person. So we look forward to that opportunity. So that is it for me. Um, how are we doing on time? Good. We're doing good. Um, we had some questions pop up. Um, let's see, as a 73 year old female, I'm having more emotional problems with aging than physical. How do I deal with that? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, so there's a lot of good free and low cost um, resources through CSU that you can access. The one that comes to mind and Maybe if Allie is still on the call, she can put the um, website up, but if not, um, we can share that with Ryan later, is um, the Aging Center of the Rockies, Aging Clinic of the Rockies, I mean, who um, actually specialize in, in mental health um, in aging adults. And so it's a wonderful um, resource and it's either free or on a very, uh, on a sliding scale based on income. So um, they'll do televisits, there are group support opportunities. So I think there's definitely, um, some opportunity for you to connect there. That's my probably my best one. And then there's also, um, you know, the Area Agency on Aging, in, and I don't know what county you're in, but they're all, they're exist in almost every county. Um, also have a ton of resources for mental health for older adults. And um, so they would also be able to share some um, helpful information. And finally, um, Senior Access Points, which is a, another website we can point you to, um, would be another great uh, resource and they can point you to a number of different nonprofits in the area that do services including you know visiting um, animal assisted therapy um, all kinds of things that are safe and socially distant and and are appropriate for for making sure that you stay safe during this time we have another one for you dr. Earhart um, this is from Jim uh, he says please excuse me for uh, asking something that was not clear to me during one of the side, slide presentations, but how are you testing protocols being incorporated into the actual deployment startup practices for individual students on CSU campuses this fall? Yeah, um, great question, Jim. Thank you. And so um, we have a testing strategy that's being um, refined right now at the higher administration at CSU. I am part of the task force on that, trying to help advise how that will take place. 
Um, a lot of what's being discussed, it's not, again, not totally um, complete yet, but there'll be widespread testing as well as surveillance testing in a, not, a lot of different methods, including pool testing, environmental surveillance, wastewater surveillance. And we are bringing the expertise, a lot of the expertise on campus, including the epidemiologists and computer modeling people. Um, and so I see that you're a PhD student in systems engineering. I mean, this is something that we're bringing to bear all the great minds on campus to find out what the best method will be. And we're also getting information from other universities, but I think that CSU is probably one of the best positions universities to be able to um, address this. So thanks for that question. Does anybody else have any other questions for these two ladies? Uh, they've got a wealth of knowledge and they're willing to answer any questions you may have. Ryan. Yep. I'd be happy to respond also to the question about um, emotional changes as oh, with yeah. um, just as um, as we see so many of those challenges with our um, with our movement classes. And I would just suggest, um, I'm sure you think about these things, but it's, it's that isolation piece. It's um, getting together with other people, connecting with family as much as you can. And, and the physical piece is huge. Um, dancing with others, um, finding ways in this time to um, find a class. Uh, if, you, if you want me to reach out to you, our classes are online. Um, People don't have to have Parkinson's disease to, to participate in the classes. And um, so just, just having fun and connecting with people and, and then the physical uh, piece too is, is really helpful with that. And with that, Lisa, like if we weren't in a pandemic, would this be something that people could help out with? Like volunteer their time or anything like that? Yes. And thanks, Ryan. I, that's what I love about this collaborative piece. Um, that's kind of how, how the student, all the student collaboration has started um, and various different people that are just interested in the work. Um, so there are ways to enter into that help, help piece or just come and join. Um, it's nice to have people to help with um, spotting people, dancing with other people. Um, so yes, if, if we don't know yet, probably we won't be having the classes in person, at least initially in the fall, but, um, but once we know that, I don't know, Nicole, if you know any more about um, the, the chance, opportunity for people to come into the center, but I think that's a, a no at this point. Well, the, we're, we're opening on a limited basis to in-person stuff on August 1st, and we have, we have to presents a safety plan to the university. We are waiting for them to approve it, but it's based on a pretty low number of people in there. So I, I don't think it will be possible to do the in-person classes until we got to get a little bit more over the hump. Um, but certainly on like a two or three person type basis, there might be ways you could, you could conduct some very limited numbers. I don't know. You, you know, we can certainly talk about that. Yeah. Is there one more? Let's see. Right, oh, I see. Yeah, yep. Jim. Mm -hmm. Jim asks, is your work linked in any way with the aging work of professors Deal and Brothers in the Department of Human Development? And the answer is absolutely. Yes, they're key players in our, in our center. Um, and that's really been some of the fun things for me is, you know, I come from a, like a, a, a translational science background. So the social science, developmental sciences, um, that, that has been, uh, and then, you know, the arts has been so much of a, a great, I don't know, um, bandwidth experience for me to see how, and that's exactly why the Aging Center exists, is to bring that interdisciplinary perspective to aging. So Dr. Deal and Dr. Brothers in the department are part of a bunch of different um, clinical trials that are going on. They have um, been very active in helping create even messaging for our surveillance testing program to help translate into, you know, kind of basic language and infographics that help explain why it's important to do it, that help increase um, participation in our study. So yeah, it's very linked. And, um, and I guess that's kind of, for me, maybe one of the best parts of my job is to be able to interact with people from so many 
um, so much different expertise perspectives and it opens my mind all the time. But I think that really speaks to that whole concept of, you know, reaching across and beyond walls that were traditionally, we tend to get pretty um, isolated, I guess, in our, our disciplines and we're really good at drilling deep down into our disciplines of study. Um, but where we really need to continue to look is across disciplines because the greatest challenges require the perspective of the lens of, of all the disciplines, not just one. And so to me, that's the beauty of the center and the fact that I work with Lisa and Dr. Deal and Ali Brothers and many others. I mean, just that to me is probably the most powerful aspect of what we're doing. And I'm just glad you brought that up. Thanks, Jim. Anyone else have any other questions? Um, one I kind of have for you, Dr. Earhart, is um, obviously we hear all these things about COVID. Like, it just seems to change on the daily. Like, mm -hmm. either you get a package and it's – you either wipe it down or it's going to be – the virus is there for 24 hours or if not longer. Um, is there any, like, proper protocol on that kind of stuff? And then just, like, 30 seconds, wash your hands. Is that still kind of the, the thing to be doing or <laughs> – yeah, well, so I'll, I'll put a shameless plug in for our next Healthy Aging Expert Q&A panel, and you can ask those questions. But I'll give you the kind of Reader's Digest version here. And because you're right, it is changing. The reason it's changing is because we know a 1,000 times more today than we did at the beginning of this, and we're going to know 10,000 times more three months ago from now, I mean, than we do today. So, you know, that's why it's changing. And, you know, it, 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 we learn more and more. But I will say that you have three big tools in your, in your toolbox um, in terms of like public facing stuff. One is, well, time, distance, and density. Stay away from high density crowds. Stay out of closed spaces in, for long periods of time, if you can, um, with people that you don't know their status, okay? And then um, time, density, distance, yeah. Keep your, keep your social distance and wear a mask. Yes, and washing hands with soap and water for 20 seconds is truly a very effective way to keep yourself from infecting something, yourself from something you've touched. Wash frequently, and I know it sounds so basic, but it's really important, and honestly, basic tools are all that we have right now, and if we, if we can use every tool in the toolbox, time, distance, density, minimize all that stuff, wash your hands, wear a mask, those are the best tools we have. Let's use them. Let's just use them until we figure out the other tools that we're going to need. And other tools are coming. They're really, they really are. There's a lot of hope on the horizon. But, you know, in the meantime, this is what we can do. Let's do it. Perfect. I mean, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to jump in the chat. Um, I will be including all their information in our thank you email with a survey. Uh, I also include like their upcoming calendars of events along with our alumni calendar. Um, yeah, and in the survey, if there, you like these, these types of discussions, please let me know. Uh, we definitely want to continue these kinds of things because we hear a lot of stuff on campus, but sometimes you just hear little tidbits and just to hear all this very valuable information really helps people know what's going on and for them to get funding that they need to do these things. So um, if anyone else has any questions, uh, if not, um, we'll end it there. And if you ladies want to have a little goodbye or anything, feel free to jump in. I'll just, I'll just say thank you for joining tonight and for the great questions. Thank you. And thanks for having me, Ryan. Oh, uh, Bill just jumped in and said, what about bringing in groceries and other things? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, you should come to our COVID expert Q&A, but I will answer that question. So you did ask about packages and stuff. Hey, it's always a good idea to wipe things down with like a Clorox wipe where you can make your own Clorox wipes out of just dilute Clorox and water and, and just wash. It's always good to wipe down your phone and other things. It doesn't require, it's, it's actually the, um, it's much less likely that you're going to get some type of infectious dose from groceries. Um, or packages than it is from being around other people that have it. That's really the biggie. Um, but 
I would always err on the side of caution. You know, don't have to leave your groceries outside for three days or any of that stuff. Pretty sure that's not, that's not effective, or at least it's not necessary. I shouldn't say it's not effective. So just wipe stuff down, wash your vegetables, you know, just basic food safety, you'll be fine. Um, and then wash your hands a lot. So I always wash my hands the minute I come into the house after the grocery store. And then after I've unpacked groceries, I wash my hands again. And I certainly would wash all the fresh produce before I eat it. But that's probably pretty good practice no matter whether you're in COVID or not. So hopefully that answers your question to some extent. And Bill, I would be more than happy to have you join us um, if you have more questions. I mean, these are great questions and they're common questions. So that's exactly why we developed that panel. Perfect. Well, if anyone else has any questions, um, I will have the link for the upcoming panel on that so you can shoot them their way. And then otherwise, I just want to thank everyone for your time tonight. You ladies were great. This is so informational. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight on this, you know, this Wednesday night and getting some good information about what's happening on campus. All right. Take care of each other, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody.